how to process EDM vocals. What's up, Daw Nation? Welcome to this week's episode of In The Daw with Unlike Pluto, breaking down the song Everything Black featuring Mike Taylor that was released on Monster Cat. In this episode, you're going to learn about the best way to record vocals. We're going to talk about how important an intro really is, how to make unique piano chords, over compressing everything and why it's amazing, how to make a stereo 808 mixing through bad headphones, and of course, how to process EDM vocals. And finally, this episode is sponsored by the A5 and Daw Nation Sound Design Course called the school base if you want to learn more about that we're going to talk about that later on at the end of this episode but daw nation let's get into this week's episode with unlike pluto and go in the daw right now This song is featuring Mike Taylor. This was our second session. So the first session we had together, we wrote a piano jam and it was sounded good, but we knew we had to keep writing and get to know each other, all that stuff. And next session we had, he came to the studio in like a black Jeep dressed in all black. And then I was also wearing all black. I usually just wear all black. And then we just like joked around about it. And then he showed me this uh, Nina Simone interview where she talked about black, blackness. And after this interview, we kind of just messed around with a guitar loop and I had like a sample from the sixties. It was like a boom, the, did that. And then he wrote the hook, everything black. And then he's like, Arma, I'm like, what? He's like, delete everything. I'm like, what do you mean? He's like, just delete all the instruments, bro. I'm like, okay. So I delete them all. And he's like, start from, take my vocal and put a piano under it. So then I started jamming on the piano and I put it under when he was saying Blackbird, Black Moon, all that stuff. And then after that, I kind of just formed the entire song with the piano. And then I had this Japanese drum loop that I based the whole song on. And that's everything black. This is the verse vocal. What I did for vocals for this one was I recorded with a Lewitt microphone. And I actually recorded the second verse with the U87, I remember. And I don't know how we matched it. I think this is the second verse. Yeah, I had to like do some weird EQing. We used a Lua microphone, recorded it in the studio, and I melodined said track, put main vocals through this. Um, I use Studio One now, so this is just instant. But on Ableton, you have to click transfer. Melodine the vocals. This is Mike Taylor. We'll play a little sample. Shadows fall over my heart. Oh, man. Oh, yeah. I blacked out the moon. Oh. I wait for you to come around. You got me dead. And he did that. And that was when we first made the song. Like Mike works really fast. So he just like wrote it and he recorded it. He, I usually like vocals are like, ah, oh, let's make it. Let's record like next week. He's like, no, nah, we're doing it now. I'm like, okay, that's cool. So that's the vocal. And honestly, I didn't put much on his vocal. I literally just put a compressor, put a little bit of delay and I put a Valhalla plate. I wouldn't do that now, but that's what I did back then. <laughs> Very simplistic. Okay, so I did send the vocals through a lot of effects chains. I sent all of the vocals through a plate. Let's see what else. Shadows fall over. Okay, I used to do this a lot. So this was an older trick of mine that I don't do anymore. I don't know why, because maybe I'm just lazy. I used to have two effects chains or two effects sends, auxiliaries. I don't know what we're calling it anymore. Return channels? Yeah, return channels. That's fine. Return channels, auxiliaries. I used to have two of them. I would have a filter delay. I would take out all the low and lower mid range. This would be a side chain. Yeah, I side, would side chain to the kick. I would do left and right. And I would variate the, the delay just a little bit. And I would run a lot through it and just stereo spread everything and make it slight delay and turn it super down so you barely hear it. You more just feel it. That's what I used to do. So the vocals, all the vocals are going through a plate. They're going through the left and right filter delay. Ah, and then to brighten up vocals, what I used to do, now I use Clarifonic, uh, the plugin from Kush Audio. I love that's one of my favorite what is plugins. It? I've never heard of that but before. I, what is that? It's an amazing plugin. I used to saturate with either Decapitator or Ableton Saturator. And I would literally just cut off everything and boost the super highs. And then I believe this is probably a de-esser. I'm going to assume. And I would de-ess the vocal and around like... I mean, every, every vocalist is different, but probably around 4.5K for males to 5K. And then I would turn it down and that would brighten up the vocal. And then that would brighten up the vocal. What's up? What's up, dude? That's cool. That's cool. Oh, no, okay, so the next one is shadows fall over my heart. 
oh, this was a real to real plugin. I don't know where that is anymore. I don't know if they're real to real to real. And I definitely was the, the it was a hundred percent on the wet scale. So it would just be running through basically like a tape machine. And then Valhalla vintage verb. And that's it for the vocals, honestly. You know, I wouldn't I wouldn't approach that now. I would approach that differently. I've I have like a vocal effects chain and everything now. As far as vocalists like Mike Taylor and Joanna Jones, who's on Waiting for You and like the Y Mona project, these vocalists are very distinct and they're very they have such a tonal quality to their voice. Their timbre is just so unique that it's almost a crime to put a lot of effects on their vocals. It's almost a crime, dude. And I noticed that a lot of producers just go ahead and go with the vocals they compress it they'll put saturation they'll just do a bunch of delay and like chorus and i'm like i get it dude but for mike taylor and joanna jones you don't need to do that and there's a lot of vocalists like them if you have a unique tone just shine the tone like make sure the tone is coming through it's cutting through the mix and that's all you need to do for a mike taylor vocalist in my opinion but then again a mike taylor vocalist is very rare like he's very unique now i use studio one for vocals, I use a Steven Slate microphone and I have like a preset for my vocals, but for other people, like if I'm recording Joanna, for instance, or Mike, I'll change the microphone to a, I'll just change up some stuff and I won't compress. Like with my vocals, I like compressing because I like the tonal quality, but with them, not much. But as far as vocals now, I pretty much make a very scratch version of the track and I'll work on the instrumental for like five days. And then I'll export the instrumental to Studio One. And then I'll just literally do all of the vocals. I'll be in Studio One for probably four days, four or five days. And I'll just be recording the main vocal for like a day and a half. And I'll comp together and comping is so much better. Ableton doesn't comp and it pisses me off. Ableton, please... Please just add playlist, man. I love you guys. Playlist, man. But I comp the main vocal and then I'll do a bunch of like harmonies, doubles. I'll even whisper sometimes like I'll even do that like left and right. And it sounds super weird because it's like you're faking that your voice is airy almost. And the cool thing about Studio One is you can melodyne on the spot. So like, let's say you record it. Da, da, da. You just do for me. My command is control M on PC and then It'll pull it up and Melodyne's built into Studio One and you can literally just tune the vocal in five seconds, print it. Oh, it's not in tune still? You want to go back and tune it again? Control M. Oh, then you can tune it again. We got the beginning vocals and is there any other... You mentioned a piano that was coming in. What other elements are in the intro? So the intro, I remember I made the entire song. Like I usually... I'm not good at intros and it pains me to say this because intros are very important, especially in the Spotify and streaming era. The first five seconds of your song needs to be like... Oh, it needs to be that. Otherwise, people don't care. Even me. Like, if I just hear a little bass in the beginning, I'm like, ah, I'm okay. Uh, but the intro, I literally just took the drop and I low passed it. And then I brought up the filter and then it evens out into the verse. Kind of a cheat cop out, but that's what I did. <laughs> I wanted to introduce the lead. I wanted the dun 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 I wanted to put that in a really eloquent way. So yeah, I did intro. Um, as you can hear, that's just the drop. Shadows fall over my heart. So here, all you have pretty much is the piano. Oh, you have a lot of stuff. I used to layer a lot, dude, back in the day. But the thing is, a lot of my layers didn't really do much of... You more just would feel the layers, but it's essentially a piano, a vocal sample, and his vocals. Here. Shadows fall And the snap, of course. Shadow That's uh, Alicia Keys. I used to use that pretty much on everything. Yeah, I don't know. I probably took out the low mids. Interesting. Okay, now I would pretty much do... I use Pro-Q3. Oh, this is weird using Pro-Q2. Wow. Um, I would use... To leave room for vocals, typically I would do this. <laughs> I would like get all the low mids and just compress it. Multi-band compress it. Probably like negative 3 dB. And that always leaves room for the vocals. That's what I would do now. I don't know what I did back then. So this is the piano. Simple chords. Got some seventh chords in there. Oh, yeah, that's nice. Little accoutrement. Okay, cool. So pretty much it's just like straight legato chords in the beginning. And then when the drums kick in, I just make everything just more rhythmic. And when that happens, I added layers of simplant. As you can see here, I tried to add the simplant stuff and when I first made the track, and it probably didn't work. So trial and fair, man. 
Yeah, so the beginning is just his vocal legato chords, really kind of basic seventh chord progression. And I believe this is in C minor. The hardest part was this. When he did like Blackbird, Black Moon, like that when it was intense, you know, and you can't just put chords. You can't just put, huh. you can't just put that on it. That's not going to work. So what I wanted to do was kind of match his intensity with piano. And to do that, I didn't want to go, dun, 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 right? I wanted to go, dun, 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 dun. Like I wanted a unique rhythm to kind of balance and match his intensity with his vocal, but also kind of fill in the empty spaces when he wasn't singing. If I were to go back, you see all these like, It's probably like that. It's dun, 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 dun. You can see it. Like, I think I put the intensity of those a little too down. I would now, I would make those louder because that's unique. And I would probably layer those off the things that are happening on the off beats with a percussion to make it more noticeable. That's what I would do in 2019. I don't know what this is. This is a stab. Oh, I love that. Okay. So, yeah. I, baby, you should come with me. I'll take you to the dark side. Me and you. All right. So, this is just like a counterpoint thing just to fill in the empty space. So you have music writing, music 101, man. Yeah, there's just a little off, not really offbeat, it's just a little counterpoint thing to fill in the empty space. I remember a week before I turned in the song, I was like, the verses are a little boring instrumentally. Because again, I never want to step on a vocalist like Mike Taylor or Joanna Jones. Never. Their voices are like Mike's voice is so powerful and like smoky and just gorgeous that it would be a crime to put a bunch behind it that was popular at the time. It's just, I think it's a crime. I don't want to do that. That's why I just have piano. It's pretty safe. And as you can tell, I try layering stuff, but like end up deleting it right here. But what I ended up doing was finding, I think I used, I think this is actually the samples from Output. It's an out, synth from Output on Contact. Exhale. 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 That's what it was. Yeah, this is from Exhale, I think. And I just resampled it. But that's, I found a sample on there. I thought it was really cool. Saturated. Let's see what we had. So I saturated it. Okay. I don't know why I did this. And I put Valhalla Plate on it. And it's just a vocal sample that I think it's kind of just like legato when it colors under the piano. It makes it, it gives it like a unique vibe. Although that was cool when I first heard it. Shadows fall. When you combine that with a piano, you have like a nice. And to me, that's like, whenever I like, I love using sampler. That's why I also love Flume. Dude, Flume is genius, man. The way he approaches percussion and drums, it's never on time. It's just so perfect, man. It's, it makes it so like realistic and sorry, tangent. But that was the purpose of this vocal sample was to give it kind of like a lo-fi vibe. I was going for a hip hop vibe, but I don't think that came across, but that's what it was. And then I added this, just cuz. Splice like wasn't a huge thing when I made this song. Like, this is 2015, man. We didn't have Splice. I mean, Splice was a thing, but no one, it wasn't like a desktop app, if I remember. Now it's crazy. You can literally find all of these samples just right there. Like something like this. You don't, you don't have to make it anymore. That's just available to you. It's amazing. It's like ear candy. It's just it's under a good the, term for it, ear candy. Ear candy. It's like under the piano chords. You know, you play the chords, but you need under it to make it interesting. Because everyone's heard piano chords before. Going to the bass. So I actually made a really simple bass part on Trillion. Literally just... Follow the piano. I didn't follow the drums too much. I just followed the piano rhythm. And what I did for the layers was this is Trillion Clean Fender full range. I love Trillion. Pro Q2. Yeah, this was my preset. It just like boosted the lows, took out some of the low mids, took out super highs. Yeah, compressed it once. Oh, that's a lot of compression. So I compressed yeah. it and then I side chained it to the kick and then I put a lot of layers on it. 
I did this with 808s a lot too. So you have like the low base, you have your main, right? Just your centerpiece of, you want that low end to be in the center. This is the first like distortion layer. I took out all. Why do you think you crushed it so much with the compressor? Sounds good. Look, compression, you're essentially going, you're squashing it. It's like a volume knob, right? You're just, you're making it not go past a certain volume. But when you turn up the makeup gain, you're bringing up all the noise floor. So everything just sounds good. Like that's why a lot of us in EDM just multi-band everything. And it sounds good. You're almost like brick walling everything and it sounds cool. It's that's the thing. Like when I used to do it, like I listened back at my tracks from like two, like 2010 and I used to literally have like eight multi bands on like a lead part. And it's like all of you guys went, wow, but it sounded cool. Who cares? It sounds cool, man. Like don't do it to a vocal, but to anything else, like it's fair game. There's no right or wrong way. So compress the piss out of all of this. Oh, I saturate it with Trillion, I believe. When I was in the whole jazz phase, I would layer essentially like a real bass like Trillion. Well, it's not real, but a sampled bass like Trillion with 808s. And I would essentially layer the 808 like this. Just the, the saturation part of it. Take it out everything. And then I would left and right that. For my 808s, I would essentially have the 808 in the center. I would saturate it a little bit, and that would be like your low end. That would be the sub. And left and right, I would detune slightly, left and right, both of them, like up and down for like five cents, give or take. And then I would saturate them with different saturators, left and right. And I would time them differently too. It creates like a false sense of bass. That makes any sense. Like if you play on your laptop speaker, you don't feel the bass. I mean, 2014 MacBooks, you, there was no bass. There's no sub. You wouldn't uh, hear the sub, but because of like saturating like the low mids, you could feel it. It's almost like a, I don't know, it's like faking it almost. That makes sense. That's what I used to be obsessed with, just like faking and layering 808s. But yeah, this one is just like a real bass, a trillion bass layered with an 808. Do you think that was, the, do you think the technique you used there, like you mentioned, like on uh, um, various Max book speakers and something like that, that you can't, you know, you can't hear the sub or feel the sub. So this is kind of a way for people to hear slash feel that on speakers and setups that don't really have the sub. Cause I know that, that like that's, that's a platform that a lot of people listen to music on is headphones that don't have a lot of bass or speakers that don't have a lot of bass. Absolutely. I think, well, that, that was my rationale. That's why I also mix on, I'm not saying here right now, but I literally mix on iPhone headphones. Like whenever I'm making, even making the song, I have iPhone headphones and I always send it to my laptop, like this laptop speaker. This is like 20, 2014, whatever MacBook. And yeah, I think you can give like, a false sense of sub. Uh, I think it's from saturating the low mids. That's from my experience. And a little bit of the highs. I think it's really important as well. And a lot of early trap music, like to me, that's why I loved Arl Grime. It, he murdered the, the 808s, dude. Uh, he was so good at them. That was my rationale behind this one, man. I think there was just one song. It was uh, No Rainbows in the Desert. It was the really metal one, metal polluted tape. And I mixed it in these headphones. Wow, I was like, where's my headphones? I'm mixing these. These are Sennheiser 280s. I forgot what they are. 380s? I don't remember. Entirely in these. And then my KRK speakers. I literally plug it in and I listen to it on my AirPods. Horrible. Like it's so many harsh frequencies that were just destroying my eardrums. I was like, dude, you need to mix on different sets of speakers while you make the song. And that's what I started doing. Just to avoid the problem at the end, because you don't want to like, you're done with the song. You don't want to go back and do the tedious task of like, I don't know, taking out harsh frequencies. And sometimes even that like kind of ruins the song in a way, because you're taking out some of the harsh frequencies you shouldn't take out all the way. I've learned that as well. Like some of them are just nasty. Like they're usually around three to what, 5K or 6K even. You, know, you, you can compress with Pro Q3. You can compress those down slightly. You don't need to put it all the way because sometimes that gives it the color. Because I've seen people just go and take it out. And I'm like, bro, like your lead part moves. You need to like move with the lead part. That harsh frequency isn't going to be harsh all the time. That's why I love Pro Q3. Like I also just DS my vocals now with Pro Q3. Literally, I just do. And it's cool because every track is kind of different. I didn't know what I was doing and I still don't when I'm making it like this. You essentially just layer and you put stuff together and you make it work. And that's the whole beauty of music production now. You generally know what you're doing, but you shouldn't always know what you're doing. That's lame. If you always know what you're doing, there's no surprises. That makes music not fun at all. Experiment, man. Get a percussion, maybe tune it, and then make that layered with the bass. Who knows? It's art. You know, there are no rules. The kick drum is, I don't know why I named it that, but this is literally, I got it from a vinyl. Like I legit got this from a vinyl. And this is the kick I used. So good, man. It's a nice kick, yeah.
You said um, you went to a Amoeba and found a vinyl with that on it and just recorded it? Found a vinyl with it on it, recorded it. I did mess with it though. Like I did, you don't see it here, but I did layer it right here. But what I did was like, in another Ableton session, I had the kick drum. Is What I used to do is just like layer the kick drum and then resample it and then put it in the session. So that's what this is. You're listening to like that kick, but also some other stuff in it. I forgot what it was. And then a snare. Sampled kind of hip hoppy 90s vibe snare it sounds like uh yeah put a snap keep a snap in there put the clap every other every other hit classic four on the floor right there another layer of clap um put a reverb clap right here See, now I would take out the low end of that. There's, there should be no reason your clap should have that much low end. And then you have a snap, another layer of snap. Ooh, I love... Oh, yeah, I remember making that. I literally like had a clap, compressed it, did some weird with it, and I made this weird like... Sounds cool, right? Choosing the right samples. Boom. I don't know why, but that reminds me of like a, what David Bowie producer would do. And then percussion. Das perk. Oh, and the court and the drops. I would layer. I think another snare with it. Yeah, I would layer another. Yeah. Like layer another kick too. Actually, um, I wouldn't do that now. That was the build up. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So for the build up, there is a the drum fill that I used. I don't even know where I got this from, bro. But it's I loved it. Again, this is one of those things I, I sampled. That's what made this track so cool and so special was like, I would wake up every morning and just sample the vinyls that I would collect from Amoeba or the pictures I took and go on like YouTube and see all that was cool. Like these are all from that. That's why I like, I love this era of me making like this jazz stuff because I really cared and put time and effort into it. And I didn't just make a seventh chord and put like splice samples on it. I spent time and I crafted the drums and I cared, you know? Like, I don't know, this is from like, I think this was a live performance on YouTube, if I remember. Yeah, it's just like when you listen to it with the track, dude. Almost like a marching band kind of thing. By the way, the people that are seeing Turn Down For What, yes, I use Turn Down For What as a reference mix for everything black. Why? Great mix. I don't care what anyone says. That mix is impeccable. Whoever mixed and mastered that song, Grammy. That's amazing. Dude, the low end, I love that song. So for the drop... What we did, Mike, in the session, when I recorded his vocal, he was like, yo, dude, sample my vocal. And I was like, okay, cool. So I did this. This is actually the original drop melody and I ended up changing it. But this was something I just went very EDM on. Am I proud of it? No, I'm not proud of it. But did I do it? Yes, I did. I did do it. So I decapitated, saturated his vocal sample. Look at this. <laughs> Oh yeah, dude, look at this. Yeah, pretty much like, you know, here, here's it, here's without it. That's cool, that sounds cool, but this sounds way cooler. Sorry, bro, I don't care if that's the wrong thing to do, that's what I did and it sounded cool. I don't do this, I would still over compress something like that in the mix because now what I would do is I would freeze it and you would get the really sharp transients Essentially, this is almost like transient making, like over compressing. I would get the sharp transients and like tame them down. So like you're not following basic rules of production at all, but you have the power now to resample and tame the audio. That's what's cool about modern music production. So that's the lead part. For the build up, this is what I had originally. And I got home. I was like, ah, that's cool for a build up, but not cool for a drop. And then I literally just pulled up. It was cage brass on contact. That was what I used. And I literally just jammed on the chords for the drop. It's just jammed and I came up with this.
That's just me jamming. I just played it in. I don't even know if I like quantized it. I probably did. This is 2015. I didn't even put anything on it. I literally just automated the gain. Oh, by the way, I never, yeah, even here, I never automated the volume in Ableton because I always wanted the capability of just going in and turning everything down, literally. So I always just put either automate the makeup on a compressor or just putting in a utility and automating the gain. That's what I would do. That's even now. That's what I still do. Because I want the I want I just want the options going command or control all and turn it down. Because I always finish the tracks with nothing on the master with like six dB or even seven dB of headroom. So when I go for the mastering stage, I can I have a lot of room. So that's the lead. There's a lot of layers. I went layer happy with this, bro. So essentially, I got the trombone part and then I layered it with the vocal sample. <laughs> so that and then put an octave higher when in doubt octave higher and then this one i think is just uh i distorted the vocal sample this is weird like you can just do an auxiliary channel for these this is kind of unnecessary cpu usage but i distorted and put a lot of reverb valhalla vintage verb right here You don't even hear those two channels. You don't even hear them. It's unnecessary. So ignore those. <laughs> yeah, and then from the vocal sample, I had the trombone. I did minus 12 trombone, because why not? <laughs> then I layered with the simplant. <laughs> Oof. Guys, we're, my CPU is like... <laughs> yeah, then, so it's basically a vocal sample, a trombone, a little sim plant, which you probably won't hear, because again, 2015, I would just layer. And then a piano lead. That's probably a higher octave, I'm assuming. <laughs> and that, my friend, is the drop to everything black. I have something else to add. For the bass, I went completely 808, and I didn't use... Okay, so initially, I had an operator as a sub. Hmm. That's what I have for the drop. And I remember listening to it before release and I was like, yeah, this doesn't like, oh, it's too clean. It's not in the pocket or it doesn't feel right because I don't know what it is. It just didn't feel right. So what I do is I literally just change it to an 808. So 808. A little bit of saturation. And then I think I side chained it twice. I remember. I don't know why. Not proud of it. That's the first 808. Just like saturated. So I got the 808. This is an up all night sample. I used to use this a lot back in the day. Um, and then I layered that left and right at the same sample. And I saturated them slightly differently. And I detuned them a little bit. You have a stereo effect of the sub. And the reason I do this, again, as I said before, is to give listeners that are not that don't have access to sub the the feeling of sub it's like a false sense of having oh there's sub in the track so you can hear that's the part where I bob my head that you have the center 808 two left and right and then I layered it with two synths I used spire which I haven't used in like 3 years but use that right here gives it a nice color tonal then I layered a little silent one synth why is that in the 808 channel in, in the 808 group not really sure not really sure guys that should not that should not be in there but it's okay it is in there bada bing bada boom combine the lead the 808 and the drums bro oh and the chords from the piano are, are still playing as well heavily side chained to the kick and snare why edm bro How that drop I think came out was just the lead part. It was just the musicality was more time was spent on the musicality part of it. So making sure, you know, like when Mike made me start from scratch on piano, he made me like literally everything black sounded good with just piano and his voice. And that's what we kind of started with. So that's what made everything black so special was it sounded great with piano and just his vocal. There was no bridge to the song primarily because we just didn't write a bridge. <laughs> He was out of town. So I was like, I remember he was out of town. I was like, we need a bridge. And I just like whipped together like an instrumental part, like a wound down version of the, the chorus, or maybe it was like a verse. Maybe you yeah. Should come with me. Me and you. Who wants to give a listener a break? That's like it, dude. In the lead, there's like 
a low noise that happens after every lead note in the chorus. Was that just like his vocal turned down, like octave down or something like this? Play the lead section. Yeah, yeah. I think I, I think I know what that is. That's probably when you sample a vocal sample. And I don't think Sampler had this at the time. You couldn't warp it within Sampler. So when you, to, when you play something a lower octave, the sample will be longer. So that's probably what it was. Yeah, because it goes like... Ah, uh, uh, like it, it's just like... Let's see. So it's just his vocal, just like... Yeah. You see, now you have the option of warping it right here. I don't think we had that option back in 20, 2015. To me, the most important part about music is just making sure this song is good. Just making sure the song is good. And then what I do now is I literally just write the song and then just try not to mess it up. There was another artist and the producer that gave me some advice one time, which was like focus on writing the song first and whatever your method is, like whether it's writing chords on piano or writing the lyrics or whatever, just like focus on getting the, the like you said earlier, the musicality down and then build the production around it. I tend to agree with that. I think the best songs sound good stripped down. And I think most of them even sound better stripped down. Like a song to me that a, a perfect song to me is the neighborhood sweater weather. That's why I think basic songwriting comes in is you need to write songs. Like if you listen to everything black, essentially, if you strip it down, it's just literally a piano, Mike's vocals and a lead part and the drop. That's it, man. That's really it. And it's just literally a four on the floor drums. Like it's so simple. I wish I could show you like a newer song because it's so old, but I would essentially kind of high pass everything like lead parts, cymbals, not snares always because sometimes you kind of want the sub with the snare. I know that's not right, but like, sounds cool. Yeah, I don't know if I did it here. Probably not. That's kind of something that Alex from Pegboard Nerds, he kind of gave me this, told me the same thing that he likes to high pass like everything other than like the sub and, you know, like stuff that actually has meat to it that needs it there. Just like high pass everything. Low frequencies are the hardest thing to mix. Definitely. It's just the hardest thing because it's so loose and it's just unpredictable almost because the waves are so like hot. High frequencies are easy, man. You just compress it down. But low low frequencies, that's that's hard. You need the right speakers. <laughs> like I still, I'm still working on my low end production, man. I'm still, it just never ends. You know, making your mix bright without being too harsh while also maintaining the nice sub in your low end. That to me is the hardest thing to do in mastering. And I'm still learning it, man. But it's knowing when something sounds cool. You know, that, that to me is just, it's taste. You know, like you just need to know, oh, that sounds cool together. Let's keep it. Hey, Daw Nation. I hope you enjoyed this week's episode of In The Daw with Unlike Pluto. If you found anything in this episode that was really helpful to you, just blew your mind, go ahead and take a screenshot right now. Tag me on an Instagram story at In The Daw, Behind The Daw, and tell me what concepts really, really helped you out this week. Also, feel free to tag Unlike Pluto at ready for it? Unlike Pluto. Mind-blowing, right? I would highly encourage you to do that. We'd love to hear from you. I would also encourage you to go check out our podcast episodes over on Behind the Dog. Those episodes focus more on the emotional, philosophical, artistic, and business side of music. For example, last week, we released a Behind the Dog episode with Xylent, where we talked about albums versus singles, the importance of writing a story in every single piece of music you ever do, and what producers can learn from and apply from looking at Marvel. Okay, it was a really great episode. Everyone has been loving it. I highly encourage you to go check that out on any podcasting app, including, but not limited to, Spotify, YouTube, SoundCloud, Google Play, Deezer, iTunes, literally anywhere else that you can ever think of. So go ahead and go check those out. And finally, Donation, if you want to take your sound design skills to a whole new level, then I would highly encourage you to go check out the AU5 and Donation sound design course called The School Base. Literally, we just updated it. We moved it to a new website. It's beautiful. It's gorgeous. People are loving it. It's laid out in such an easy way. Way. There's over 20 hours of videos right now. We're about to add even more. It's, it's crazy how much content we're going to be adding. And it's going to teach you the right mindset to have with sound design. It's going to teach you the best techniques to make unique and mind-blowing sounds, really an unlimited amount of new sounds, and to teach you techniques that you can keep evolving on for years to keep creating new sounds so that your sound design can keep growing, keep evolving, keep blowing people's minds, right? Like I said, it includes over 20 hours of videos. You get effects racks, instrument racks, project files, as well as a ton of other bonuses like MIDI arrangement templates, a sound design journal template, access to the private donation Facebook group, and a personal 20-minute strategy session with me. In fact, we just added a new bonus on top of that where we have a Hall of Fame tab where if you go through the entire course, you get an extra bonus session where you get to have a one-to-one -one session with AU5 and I. You get to show us what you've learned from the course. You get to ask us any questions that you want about music production, about marketing, about anything that you want to. It's really, really great 
great. And people have been absolutely loving this feature, something to aspire to. So Donation, if all of this is sounding incredibly interesting to you, then I'd highly encourage you to head on over to Donation. Dot net. Okay, we've moved it from courses in the dot, dot net to donation dot net. That is where the school base is living now. So I'd highly encourage you to go check that out. Currently, it currently has two different price points. One of them is forty-seven dollars per month. There's no long-term commitment. You can cancel any time. It's a subscription model that you use the school base as long as you want. And when you're done, you're done. That's it. No questions asked. We also have the lifetime access model, which is two hundred and forty-seven dollars. You pay it one time. It's done. You have access for the rest of your life, and you have access to all of the current and future content that will come with the school base. Again, you can go check this out at donation.net. Also, if you want to test drive the school base, you want to see some of the things that we're going to be talking about, some of the quality of the content that we're talking about, you can find the free version of the school base, the free mini version of the school base over at courses.inthedaw.net. So the free course still does live over on courses.inthedaw.net, but the full course is over at donation.net. We're going to get it all switched over and fixed here soon, but just know that that is the free course the free version is over on courses.inthedaw.net but Don Nation, i hope you enjoyed this week's episode of in the da and if you did again please let me know either in the comments or by tagging me in an instagram story at in the da behind the da but Don Nation, i hope you have a great day we'll see you back here in two weeks for our next episode of in the da where we have slippy breaking down his song earthquake